Hello and welcome, y'all, to this week's episode of Talks with Taboo. Welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. Hope everyone's having a good week. Hope everybody's staying safe. Um, I'm gonna be real with y'all. I went out to two different restaurants last week <clears throat> and sat down and had lunch. I went out shopping too, man. I'm gonna tell y'all something. That's living. Going out there and spending your money where people can see you spending money. That's living, man. It got me excited, y'all. I'm ready to get back out there into the real world and get back to fucking, you feel me? My guest this week on the podcast is a very, very hardworking lady. She's someone who came up in the scene and made her own way. She's a senior marketing manager at AEG. She also manages SFAM. It's really cool getting to sit down with people who are making it in the industry who aren't artists because they have a whole different perspective about how things are run and how things are going to go that I normally wouldn't see or hear. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Taryn Cornejo. I really hope I said that right. Well, welcome. Welcome. Hi. Oh, hi. Howdy. Thank you for uh, being here. Dude, so this is actually cool because you were actually the first uh, woman female on Talks with Taboo. So, Yay. Shout I'm out, honored. Thank shout you. Shout out to Aaron, dude. I mean, it's been a long time coming. Ain't nothing against women or anything, you know. I'm just going to say that. Ain't nothing against women and that hadn't happened yet. You know, it's just, you know, this is the first one. I'm honored. Thank you. Yeah. So for the people who don't know you people who are like who is this Tehran? speaking of is that a, is that a french name Tehran, Tehran, come here me Tehran. You know, i don't really know people ask me all the time where my parents got my name but fun fact since i was born on christmas my mom actually wanted to name me holly noel thank god that my dad did not let that happen so i don't know where they came up with Taryn out of that but uh i'm just glad i'm not holly noel so where where, where, where is it from though like where i is have it? no idea because the last name how do you pronounce the last name try it come Mm-mm. No, <laughs> <laughs> Cornejo. Corne- that's that's uh, that's native, right? Mexican. Yeah. Oh Spanish. shit! Oh, it sounds like it could be like a native American Cornejo. I got that a lot growing up too. Everybody thought I've gotten Hawaiian, Inuit, like Japanese, all kind of stuff. No one ever guessed Mexican. Cause you even got like the tint, like I mean, to be like a native too. But I mean, yeah. that's same thing. I reckon. Yeah, my dad's side of the family. Right on. So for the people uh, who are listening, they might not know who you are. Usually I just have DJs, but I want to do a lot of more industry people. What exactly do you do in this music industry for the for the listeners that do not know? Um, a lot of things. But uh, so my full time job, I'm a senior marketing manager with AG Presents um, with their New Orleans branch, Winter Circle Productions. So I oversee our entire marketing department. For all of our regular shows, which is like 100 plus shows a year um, on the Gulf Coast, mostly New Orleans, and then digital marketing for Buku Music and Art Project, Hangout Music Festival. And then on the side, I also manage SFAM. Woo, and we're big fans of them on this podcast. <laughs> Gotta get a quick fuck taboo in there. <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> well, yeah, that's like a long title, a long list of things that you do. But, I mean, you didn't start out doing shit like that. You started off probably like in a street team, just like handing out flyers or probably just figuring out how you can get into the music industry, stuff like that. How does someone who is like, you know, out there is like, man, I really like to have a job like that where I'm marketing these shows, all these big festivals, like helping put these events together and make sure they sell. Like, how do I get into that? And, you know, they usually have to start out from the bottom, started from the bottom, now we here. Um, but how does someone get into, and how long does something like that take to get into the position that you're in? Oh, all right. So if we're going to go all the way back, let's go back to 2014. So I had actually already finished college and I graduated with a degree in criminal justice. Ha uh-huh. ha. Uh, <laughs> so you, you have a criminal degree justice? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I said I actually, criminal degree justice. Gen- criminal no, justice, criminal justice degree. degree. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I actually started out mass comm because I really wanted to be, um, I wanted to work on a radio station. Like that was my initial goal. 
And I got really discouraged. Everybody told me it was too hard for a female. It's something my parents didn't really want me to do. So I did something to appease them. And I got my criminal justice degree, which I enjoyed it, had a great time. And then once I got out of school, I was like, this is not what I want to do at all. So I just took some time off. um, And then I got into going to shows and stuff. And like you said, I started on street team. um, And really just, it took three years until I even got a part-time job um, with Winter Circle. So in that time, I was a brand ambassador for their street team. I started getting involved with a lot of music festivals, doing street teams for them and any volunteer work that I could get my hands on. Um, I remember one year I did like volunteer artist relations for Buku. Um, I got the job, I had gotten the job, a recommendation through a friend um, and just did a bunch of small things just to where I could get my foot in the door anywhere in as many different places as possible. Um, and it wasn't until with Winter Circle, they weren't allowed to have interns that weren't doing it for college credit before they were, or what's the word? When they got acquired by AEG, that's when they were allowed to have interns that weren't necessarily doing it for college credit. So since I was already out of college, basically, I was like, okay, like, this is finally my shot. So I begged for an internship. Yeah. And after years um, of street team, I finally got the internship because I had been leading the street team um, for a while after that point. And uh, I got a part-time marketing coordinator job, and I've literally just been working my way up through the company ever since. And I've had some stuff along the way. Um, You know, I worked with Insomniac and did a lot of festival stuff with them. Um, Health and safety work with ground control. And this was all in like the years that I was building up stuff with Winter Circle. So I was just kind of like learning as much as I could in different areas of the music industry. So I did ground control for a little while, and then I also did um, a couple years of gate management with um, Insomniac's headliner experience team and did a lot of operational stuff with the festival. What's so. what's the end goal for you, man? Because, I mean, you, you started from the bottom, and now you are here. I know I've done that's the second time I've done that reference, and I'm, I'm probably yeah. milking that shit dry. But, like, where, where are you wanting to go with it? Because, I mean, you're doing stuff for Buku, doing stuff for Hangout Fest. You know, I'll see you at EDC on them golf carts at fucking <laughs> Sunrise is coming up, and y'all are like, woo, today's almost over. We can finally go to sleep. So, like, what, what you know, you're putting on all this groundwork, and it's a lot of, you know, it starts off a lot of grunt work, a lot of groundwork, mm-hmm. you know, but, like, where is it that you want to go? And, like, why is it that this was, like, the thing for you as well? Like, were you, was it just something that just looked like fun? And then you were like, okay, no, I can actually make a career out of this. I, I know that's two questions in one, but you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's just the curiosity from myself. So a little bit. why was this a thing was music was always a big part of my life. Like when I was old enough to drive and check my sisters out of school, I would, and I would check them out and we would drive to new Orleans to like go sit in line to be front row at a concert, like at house of blues. Like, I was always just super into concerts, super into music. It was always my thing. But I think I was just discouraged because a lot of people told me it would be too hard to do anything in t- with it. And so after I decided to skip out on radio, I just kind of like gave up on it. So then I circled back to it once I got out of college. And was Radio's like, dead. True. It's all about the podcasting now. I mean, you see Mr. fucking Joe Rogan got that $100 million to go to Spotify. Did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. So we just didn't encourage everybody to listen to Talks with Taboo. <laughs> <laughs> Talks of Taboo next to get the deal. Dude. Oh! Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, music was always a thing for me. Um, and I just decided, like, let's really try and make this work um, during that whole hustle period. And don't get me... It was... There's a lot of times where I thought about quitting, you yeah. know, because it's just... It's really hard to, like, get your foot in anywhere. And, you know, sometimes people will say it is about the people that you know or whatever the case may be, but... It really, for me, it was just a case of like working my ass off as hard as I could until. And it's a slow grind too. The whole thing about the music industry, like you'll see people pop off out of nowhere, whether it be like like an artist or like a manager, agent, or even like a promoter, man. But it's just like it's such a slow grind. Like to think about now, I'm like, damn, I've been trying to do this or like doing this for like six years since I like started. Yeah, but now, but now it's like a full blown career for you now. So it's a yeah hard work paid off. Would you say? But what's that? What's the end goal? Like when you say damn, what is Taryn, what job title do I want to have in another six years? You know, um, what, 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 where is that at? That's something that I'm still asking myself, trying to figure out. Um, 
for now, AG and uh, of course, S Fam are my main focus. Um, I'm S Fam being number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, yeah. So my last festival with Insomniac was actually last November. So that um, I had actually gotten a promotion around that time here. So I wanted to just be able to focus fully on my job um, and the two festivals that we have. So I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about do I want to stay in New Orleans and you know, what that looks like for me. And I think I would love continuing to grow within Winter Circle, our New Orleans office. Yeah. Um, you know, I really like that my bosses give me the ability to give input, not just on marketing things, but, um, you know, they trust and value my opinions when it comes to, like, artists or curating things. So I really enjoy that part of it. But you're trying also. to take that boss's job, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I keep asking myself, so do I see myself, like, somewhere in a bigger position and like festivals overall, like maybe in the company or something or staying local to new Orleans. I'm not sure, but I'm having fun right now. Uh, I mean, for the local thing, I mean, you've done a lot for the local scene. I mean, I'm just going to tell y'all that this lady right here was actually the first lady to give me a shot when I moved here to new Orleans, man. First show that I played in new Orleans. That was a uh, winter circle show. I was direct support for snails and that show kind of changed my life in a way, especially, I mean, it changed my life in this city. Uh, for just moving here. So you like, you know, you're pretty hands on with the city. Could you see yourself like what's another city you could see yourself go into and mean like, okay, this is the city where I don't wanna I don't know. Impregnate. I've thought about I've thought about that also because I think New Orleans is so different in the terms of a lot of cities, how their scene is. Like I think we're very lucky to be like so close knit and everyone just like communicate and know each other and everyone's like, cool, man. Yeah. Everyone yeah. gets along and I don't feel like the scene is necessarily the same in other cities. So I don't know what I, where else I could see myself. I think there's only like one other city that like I've really contemplated about moving. That's like Charlotte, man. Really? Yeah. Charlotte? Yeah. Why like, Charlotte? It's just a dope town, man. I don't know about the scene. It's just a cool ass vibe. You know, it's still got like that Southern vibe, but it's just like a clean, nice, the air feels good in your mouth, you know, type, that type deal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that type of deal. Yeah. If we were talking somewhere where I wanted to just move, just to move, I could see myself. Uh, I really like Portland or somewhere in that area. Dude, Portland um, is like, it's really cool, dude, but it's just too white for me. Oh, and it's so weird because, so they have all of these signs, like when you go there. Um, I went last year sometime and they had signs like, it's such an inclusive town. Like they talk about how they're like very accepting and their signs on the door about how they accept everyone and basically like don't accept you if you're like don't accept people. Mm -hmm. But when you're walking around, it really is so white. It's so white, it's dude. It's so weird. Now I love Portland. I'm not saying I don't love Portland. No, I love it's it. It's just hella strange. white. It's like a Seattle, you know. And it's I strange love them when both. you come from New Orleans <laughs> to like go to a place like that and notice that you don't see right you're like where's the bounce music here yeah it's so weird right dude <laughs> <laughs> but i do want to bring something up oh well, before i get into that so what is the for your job right now you know you're marketing shows you know and you're managing an artist but right now in this industry in this current state you know shit ain't happening you know, so what is what does your job entail right now, whether it's being a marketing manager or a artist manager? Like what what is, what are you doing at the moment? So artist manager, um, we're actually working on some release plans right now um, for their next EP. So I'm just trying to I feel like right now the thing is to just keep them motivated or keep on a timeline to keep music coming out. Um even though we don't necessarily know when the next shows are going to come out. Right. Um, so really just working on music and figuring out what we're going to do with all of this and when the best time to release everything is. Um, yeah, Because it's, it's, it, it's tricky. It's like you want to release music, but you also want to be playing that music out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like that's like the trickiest part. But it's like also you don't want people to fucking forget you. So you got to like, keep so putting it out. So if you release an EP right now, it's like do you miss the whole cycle where this EP would be fresh to get played out? Or like... But then again, they usually play so much unreleased that a lot of this stuff is probably stuff that people have heard at shows before all this went down. So true, true. Um, AG wise, a lot of my projects, um, it's actually kind of nice getting to work on stuff that I normally don't have time to work on throughout the year, and a little bit more creative, long term projects also. 
So it's really, it's not really show involved. Um, it's more so just creative things or thinking about what it's going to look like when we reintroduce ourselves into the market and keeping our brands alive and how we do that, like in this interim period when we don't necessarily even know how long it's going to be. Because I mean, right there, that's, we have two promoter brands, a venue and two festivals. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a lot to figure out what are we going to do with all of these until the foreseeable future. You made a good point, and I want to ask that point. What is this shit going to look like? Like, what is what is phase one for AEG going to look like? And I know there's some stuff that you probably can't talk about, but your personal, even even there might even that the conversation might not be going on super far. But like in your personal opinion, not even not even having to go into like what the business is saying. What do you think that this is going to look like whenever it starts coming back? I mean, it's honestly hard to say because I think we've all seen that everything changes so much day to day or like you just you don't know what's going to happen. What if they found a vaccine in a month or what if they found something that proved that they're like, oh, this shit's going to be over or like everybody's fine now. Like, I don't know if that was the case, then we could be back at regular shows in three months, which who know? I mean, that's not going to happen because we need time to plan and obviously get everything together. But. I really don't know if I <clears throat> I don't know if I foresee a lot of people trying to do did you see the thing from this weekend where they had the first socially distanced concert in Arkansas, I think? I didn't I didn't actually see that. No, I saw that I've seen lineups come out where it's like it's it's not social it's like the car drive in concerts. Is that what you're talking about? No, or? what's his name? Travis McCready, Tr something McCready. McCready, dude. Yeah. I don't know. But somewhere in Arkansas. Sounds like a country music singer, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that's he? what I think it is. Okay, yeah. Travis McCready. I I'm just judging based on the I saw a cowboy hat on him. I didn't well, listen to music. I mean I got so three I in here. Yeah. So I mean I mean I ain't no damn country music singer. Um uh, but yeah, so they did one um, in Arkansas, and the venue this weekend was scaled from like twelve hundred to two hundred people. Ooh, or that's something. a that's a massive scale down. Yeah, and I don't even know if they sold all two hundred tickets. Um, but everybody in the venue was very spaced out. The restrooms half were blocked off. Like concessions were only sold prepackaged, like drinks. And it's just like when you think about all this, of like, it'll be interesting to see if this is actually feasible for anyone. Like, I just don't know if that even makes sense financially for a lot of companies, to, like, depending on how much an artist is getting paid or, like, opening a venue and, like, doing all this for something that's so small. So I don't know what it's going to look like. Like, are more smaller promoters going to be trying to do, like, the drive-in shows and stuff like that? Probably. But as for venue shows, I really don't know what that's going to look like because also it's just, like, how do you enforce social distancing once you're inside and also like nobody wants to be the the people that like had an outbreak right at first like, it's like put your shirt back on now yeah. it's like hey fucking take two steps back buddy isn't it so weird watching show footage right now i was watching the little uzi vert from our show back in like 2017 I yesterday that, that, that and i was like can you like believe that was a, like we were just like sweaty in mosh pits crowd surfing like did we posted a, a, a video from new year's today and it was like you know two thousand people close together i was like fuck man yeah. What is this world? It's crazy. Yeah, it's a different planet. So yeah, I really don't know what it's going to look like. But the different planet is still Earth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the companies are going to try to figure out, you know, what we can do in this interim. But then at the same time, it's like, is there a place for promoters in the digital sphere? Like, do you even really need a promoter in the digital sphere? Like, I don't know the answer to that. And also, when you say digital sphere, you're talking about like Twitch sets and stuff like that. Yeah, like where does the promoter fit into all that? Yeah, but also like, is it that monetizable? You know what I mean? Like, you know, well, from a promoter standpoint, like, no. say, I mean, if you run it from the artist Twitch and stuff, like, if their accounts are bigger, like, is it really monetizable for us? I don't no. know, but I think that's something that everybody's probably trying to figure out. But then at the end of the day, I also ask myself like if we spend so much time trying to figure this other stuff out when we could be like perfecting other things for like our regular shows when they do come back right or just things that we could have worked on like how far down this like wormhole of digital world are we gonna go right. i've been asking i think about it every day and i like, don't know the digital shows just aren't the same you know what i mean there's something about just like getting in trouble with your homies at a venue yeah and i'm not promoting getting in trouble and getting in trouble doesn't actually mean getting in trouble it means causing a ruckus you know what i'm saying hood ratchet dude. i mean we severe republic all the time 
Dude, yeah, like, like I'm missing all, all my homies. homies. Yeah, I'm missing all my homies, man. I'd see you at almost at every show I'd go to. You were there. I wouldn't say every, but you know, if there's a sh- a dope show in town, I'd see you there. Yeah, and I'd say what's up. We dab it up, say what's good, and uh-huh. then we'd say fuck you because you manage us, fam, and then yeah. <laughs> walk away. I know. I think the last show I went to was probably the last one I saw you at. Actually, was the Boogie T Mardi Gras show. Dude, that, was, that was my favorite show of the year. The yeah, Boogie Trio. You looked like you had a fun time. I was dancing my ass off, dude. Dude, there was some guy. Man, there was this fucking guy coming up to me at the show, though. And he kept on. He would literally walk to me. He's like, dude, you should fuck with me. And he's trying to show me a song in the middle of the set. And I'm like, dude, I don't give a fuck. I'm like, like, I can't I'm like, hear you. <laughs> I, said, well, I totally told him. I literally told him, like, dude, I don't care. I'm trying to dance. I didn't want to talk. I wasn't talking to anybody. I was dancing, bro. I was say, yeah, you were in your wig just having a good ass time. Yeah, I was. I reached my final form during Mardi Gras. <laughs> I've learned that. <laughs> no, that's crazy, man. Like the digital. I, I mean, I just hope that's not the future of shows. I don't think it's the future, but I'm interested to see if. I think artists will still somewhat care. More artists that didn't care about the digital stuff before and streams will probably still partake like once all this is over and some right, things. Right. But I'm curious if promoters or anyone are actually going to try to do anything in the digital sphere like once this is over. Because I'm like you, I don't. I just don't feel like it's the same. Like, I've watched a couple. Obviously, the ones that the boys have done. Shout out Lost Dogs. Watch that one. It was fire. I'm sure, um, yeah. Lost Dogs. Love all those fellas, even though they don't know where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's like, will all this have a place after? Like, how long can this survive? And then also thinking about how many of these people, if we did try to monetize it into, like, a subscription-based or you pay for this stream, like, how many people would actually pay for it? Like, do you think that people, people are, are too spoiled to do it at this point? Yeah. It's like, do you think that people are like enjoying all the content right now? But the minute we flip the switch and ask them to pay for it, they're just like, oh, I don't care anymore. Like I've already had too much for free. Like who cares? But then you also have a lot of fans who are donating and shit like that. So, you know, I was actually one of the anti stream guys when this first started for music. I was doing dumb streams where I'm like telling the news, getting drunk, reading your fortune, getting drunk. All of them ended up with me getting drunk. Okay. I was just like, <laughs> that's usually how most of the streams went. But I ended up caving and i did a dj stream okay now i, I think uh people donated a couple times because i was like donate this amount i'll shotgun a beer eventually I had to give that shit up but it was just like when i dj I, I don't know that i was monetized at all you know what i'm saying yeah. and it's just uh I, I don't know it's just a tricky situation and i just hope it's not the future honestly like the travis uh what is it travis diddle or something like that travis diddle me what was his name mccready mccready okay i was like i think me. that's his name D- Travis Diddle me is a way cooler name. Yeah, we we'll can just agree- go with that. Yeah, Travis Diddle me, fucking twelve hundred person venue t- scaled down to two hundred and they're separated. Imagine a dubstep show where it's not people crowded on the rail. It's like three people on the rail for the entire rail. Yeah, like that's that's no fun for anybody. Like I can't even imagine. And then is it even the same experience? Like no, it's part- not. It's not. It's like you could say, you know something is better than nothing but like part of going to the show is like being sweaty in the mosh pit with your friends or being up front like when i first started going to festivals maybe different genres are different also like maybe somebody that i don't even know what type of genre but maybe something chiller for an older demo maybe that works in like a scaled down venue that like has spaced out seating maybe they don't mind that it's not like that but when you go to an electronic show Think about every, like, the first festivals you went to, the first shows. Like, that's part of the experience is just, like, being in the crowd and just being so um, in, engulfed, engulfed yeah. in every everything that's around you, from the people to the music to just, like, you know, just, like, ridiculous things you see at festivals. People running up, like, dropping little, like, uh, party umbrellas in your drink and stuff. Like, that's uh, you happened. You be careful with them umbrellas. You feel it me? It was a friend, but still. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like, that's just, like. You can't do that kind of stuff anymore. Yeah, dude. Or not right now. Yeah, right, right. I mean, you can't be drugging people's drinks with umbrellas when you're over your home, you know? <laughs> so, it, yeah, it's just like, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know. We talk about this, like, obviously almost every day for work because it's just like, what are we going to do? What does it look like? What are people talking about? Like, what do we think is going to happen? And it's just literally, I could sit here and think about it all day, but. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just a fu- like nowadays they throw a mosh pit, but like it's just one guy in the middle doing a worm. People are taking turns. <laughs> it's like duck, duck, goose, but no one's touching each other. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's like Marco Polo, but no one comes over. No Red Rover, Red Rover, but no one sends over. <laughs> I think the... I think the thing that, like, worries me the most out of all of this, like, I've definitely talked to my boss about this, is, like, when the bigger artists will all be okay in yeah. this. Like, they're all going to be fine. But what about those mid-tier artists or the people that were just, like, starting to pop off that, you know, they're not making a ton of money per show, but, like, how long are we going to be down? And, like, how long can they survive doing this without pay? And, like, are they the ones we should be raising money for, like, when we do streams? Like, right. I mean that. I mean that's a that's a really good point, man. Because it's like the bigger artists, people aren't gonna forget about. But it's like some like an artist might be hot for a minute, like a new coming up artist. Like, this guy's hot. He's touring. He's doing all the shows. But now it's just falling off. It's just like, did they forget about that person? You know what I'm well, saying? Well, then when we come back, I also wonder what it's gonna look like. Like, our company's only gonna be focused on like the bigger artists that they're guaranteed these tickets for, or like, is it is it's still going to be like a fair playing field and have room for the smaller guys. Like, that's I don't know. That's a good know. point actually, because I could actually see it going the opposite way to where it's like people haven't been to shows in a while. You book an underground ass artist. Everyone's there because it's, it's going down. Just something yeah. It's do. just like, Oh shit, this is going down. They're saying this artist is dope. They're putting this artist on. Yo, we're going to this. What else are we going to fucking do? That's actually a good point. I haven't thought of it like that. But then when you think about it also, it's like, okay, so would that be the case or would it be the case of like, Still the bigger agencies and companies working together. So it's like most of the people with the bigger agents would probably be getting the gigs. Like, does that make sense? No, that, I mean, that makes sense too. But I mean, I think if it went straight to the bigger artists right off the bat, then that's how it's going to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if it's like easing in to like, yo, dude, we're doing this dope ass show, 300 people in a warehouse with this guy who's making deep uh, um, Christian bass music. You're like, no, you know, some shit you've never heard of. And you're like, okay, that sounds fucking weird. Let's do it. Sounds gay, I'm in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, dude. It's, um, there's so many things to think about. It's crazy. Like, I just don't know. I don't, nobody knows. It's just so unknown. <laughs> dude, I can put on my hat and wear it backwards. It's the one without, like, the, uh, like, the clips. Yeah. And you can, you can, you can promote me as a lineum. It works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, look, I want to shift gears, okay? Okay. So, as you may know, you know, you're a woman. Yeah. Last yeah. time I checked. Yeah, last time. I mean, I think we can agree on it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you're a woman who's working in this music industry, started from the bottom. Now you're, that's, I'm milking that fucking phrase. I swear to God. <laughs> and, but like, what are some struggles that being a woman in the industry bring forth? Because I feel like, you know, it's mostly men at the top. I feel like, you know what I mean? And am I wrong in saying that? Bring like the like the main uh, shot callers or whatever, but then but women are coming up, but they're not as m many. And what are some of the struggles that you have faced being a woman in this industry trying to come up? Um, I can't really pinpoint um something specifically, but there's definitely just always the like one people just assume I'm a man in an email. Like that's like the most annoying thing to me. Literally every time I don't know if it's name? just the Taryn, but sometimes. I hate just being assumed. If it was like, Tanner, I'd be like, yeah. But if it's Taryn, I'd be like, okay, that might be a female. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've definitely had people that I feel like talk to me. Like, I get mansplained to a lot. What does that mean? Mansplained, where they try to break it down and explain it to me as if I don't understand. Oh, um, shit. Yeah. But um, I think my two bosses, personally, have been very good about making sure that people treat us as equals but i mean it's definitely a thing um i feel like it's it's like the perfect time being a woman in the industry in a weird way it's kind of it's kind of weird being a southern man in the industry with women because like I've, I've run into this issue where i've called women ma'am and i've called women darling and neither one of those things are meaning anything but a sign of respect from where i'm from and they're like oh you don't call me that i'm like oh shit me knowing you, I wouldn't care if you said darling, but if somebody else called me darling, I'd be like, Well, it's just but like, I know you. But and you know, I know it's just, you don't mean anything. Yeah, I don't mean anything by it, but I've been like, I've been like, hey, you don't call me ma'am. You don't call me darling. I'm like, what the fuck, man? I can't even be a gentleman anymore. And it gets tricky <laughs> out here, man. It does. I mean, times are a change. Yeah. And for the better. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm all about women in the industry. I can say that, even though you're the first woman on the podcast. Woop woop. Woop woop. Are we talking about ICP when you say woop woop? 
<laughs> no. You ever been to ICP no. show? I know. Wait, haven't you though? I know oh, you talk about them yeah. a lot. Oh fuck yeah! Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm a juggalo, dude. You're a juggalo, straight up. Do bro. you have pictures of you in full outfit? No, I have. I haven't. I haven't been to an event where I painted up. The last event I went to, I said next event I'm painting up. Wait, did you go to the one at House of Blues? Didn't they? No, nah, I was that? out of town. I was out of town. I went to the one in uh, Baton Rouge with Attila. Where was that at? That was at the Varsity. Wow. Right, dude. ICP in the Varsity. ICP is dope. <laughs> so that was actually my first time seeing them, and like. I'm a huge Attila fan. Yeah. I love Attila. You ever listen to Attila? Long, long time ago. Their music is like, yo, fuck the haters. Do what you don't. Do what you want to do. And if they don't like it, they can suck your dick. Like, that's like my vibe. So that I fuck with Attila. I was going to see Attila. And they were on tour with ICP, which is a very odd but yeah, dope combination. It goes because both of them don't give a fuck. Yeah. And ICP went on after Attila, dude. And it was one of the most rowdy fucking events I'd ever seen in my life. The thing that sold me, because you know they spray the Fago bottles at yeah. people. So they had the Fago shooting, like they shoot it out like rockets. There's a girl behind me, and like there was a Fago body bot, bottle coming full speed at me. I ducked, and it hit this girl in the face and knocked her to the ground. She got up, picked up the remaining Fago, poured it on her as she ha- did a fucking war call and ran into the mosh pit. And in that moment, I was like, "This is fucking awesome, dude!" What a bad bitch. <laughs> dude, that was a bad bitch, man. It was awesome, man. Yeah, that uh, sounds entertaining. I don't know if ICP is a place for me, but that sounds pretty entertaining. <laughs> so, so, so out of all the shows, because Winter Circle does all types of shows, mm-hmm. all types of shows. Out of all the types of shows that you're able to market and attend, what what are your favorite shows to go to? Um, tough, because I really do like them all. And when I say that, I really do love every genre of music. Um, I think I have a special connection with Basic. So Basic for anybody that doesn't know, is our electronic promoter brand. So once we started doing a lot of electronic shows, they kind of branched off and put these under a separate wheelhouse um, to cater to the electronic community. So I think Basic definitely has a special place in my heart. For a long time, I have helped curate all of the local talent, like we were talking about earlier, Um, you know, from back in the day when it was like Clutch, SFAM, Boogie. Who else has come up? Baldy. It's crazy. It's like these core Nola people, and look at them now. It's like, yeah. it's so, it's so. It's crazy when I think about that all the time. I'm just like, it's nuts that like we put y'all on our. Because I was watching all of them in Mississippi. I was like, man, I, I want to kind of be doing what they're doing. Like, I want to be. That's why I moved here because they were like, I was seeing them have success here in New Orleans. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that I have a special connection with Basic because of that. Because I love any producer that I find that is actually mm. making their own music, and if we have the ability to give them a platform, then there's nothing more than I want to and do. The way that. you help birth this child. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I love Basic. So I love our electronic shows. Um, I definitely like trying to find um, what's the word. I don't know. Yeah, just like trying. I like that I'm like given the opportunity to tell who I like or who's popping off or, you know, new artists. And You're like, yo, you need to be checking out this person right yeah. here. Yeah, they're so making I, some dope shit. So basic is really fun. But I also really like we don't do as many of them just because it's a really hard crowd to find here in New Orleans. But I really like our smaller like indie shows or bands like we had this band microwave open for Taking Back Sunday this year, which was like. They're one of my favorite bands, and I was so excited to get them to New Orleans. Um, I was really stoked about um, fuck. What's the band? I know Bad Omens was supposed to be on the tour. They backed out of it. I was really bad excited about seeing them. I forgot what tour they were on. And then uh, the man, Dance Gavin Dance tour was awesome. That, Covet was really good. That that was one of the ones I wanted to see, and I, and it's gonna hit me in a second. So finish. I'm gonna trying to think about it. Yeah, so that I think definitely the electronic and then any of the like rock ish, any genre of rock really, whether it's like metal shit or like indie shit, stuff like that. Real friends. friends. They were supposed to be, they were, I don't know, but they were on, they were on a lineup coming to New Orleans. I was really excited for that show. I'll have to look. Yeah, my goal actually is I've pitched a few times. I like really, really before I leave New Orleans ever one day, if that comes, I really, really want to throw like a one or two day mini fest of like kind of like DIY style, but obviously it's not DIY like if we're tour. doing it, but like smaller bands and not, yeah, not necessarily. I 
guess it would kind of be like worth, but just finding the place to do it in New Orleans. It's it's something I've been talking about with my boss for like over a year. That's yeah. something I really want. Speaking to of happen. places, I mean, like one of the places they do it at, they do City Park and Mardi Gras World. That's like where the festivals are at, right? But if you wanted to have the feel of like a DIY and the crowd that those types of bands attract, like I feel like it needs to be somewhere that's not like your typical. Yeah, like in a fucking parking lot somewhere <laughs> yeah so that's let's go post up in the walmart parking lot <laughs> no i don't job don't go to that one <laughs> yeah you're gonna get robbed <laughs> at that I'm one scary. um so i like those but honestly i really like all of our genres we've been doing a lot of comedy at joy too which has been fun dude i have loved that y'all have been booking more comedy shows because i went to the jim jeffrey show you and it? it was the best comedy show ever. i went to the bill burr show that was my christmas present actually it was really? bill burr tickets yeah uh, that one was at the uh, Jackson Theater. Yeah, that one was. I don't know who did that one. Mm. That one wasn't ours. We did uh, Fred Armisen. I think was the last comedy one I went to. That was really good. Nah, dude, that that Jim Jeffrey show. I little there was a point in that show where I was curled up in the fetal position in my chair, and I was laying on my back on the on the butt <laughs> of the chair, and I had tears rolling down my face. It was. It was an amazing show. It was, it was it was the best comedy show I've ever seen. I've You're been good. to a lot of comedy shows. It was, it was fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. I was like, uh, that was a show I'll never forget. There was like a couple of jokes that he said that I will never forget. Because I'm like, <laughs> I, that's why I love Jim Jeffries. You ever been, uh, watch a Jim Jeffries set? I don't watch Jim Jeffries. He says some fucked up shit. Okay. And, and I like people who can say shit that you normally shouldn't or yeah. can't say. But in the way he says it, it's like very, very funny. And that's my type of comedy, the comedy that's really pushing that shit. I was going to say pushing on the edge. Yeah. yeah. I think, was that after your Wakan set? I don't remember what it was that you said. And we talked afterwards and I was like, that one part I cringe. And I took that joke out. I took that joke. It was like how uh, I was talking about women shaving or something like that. And that was a new joke. I hadn't had had a chance to practice it. And I, I never did that joke again. That's where you learn where your jokes work and they don't, dude. You need to try them out. That one had me cringing a little bit too when I got off. I ain't gonna lie. But yeah, I like all shows. Hell yeah. I like all music, except I really don't go to country. No offense. Sorry, anybody. You don't like a good country it. show, man. But the thing about like like country gatherings, like country shows are great, but country gatherings are where the problem's at. They're more dangerous than any of our festivals ever. I swear are. to God, <laughs> like, dude. I swear to God. Yeah, 100%. Everybody's too drunk. Everyone's fighting. Like, when I went to Bayou Country mm. Superfest, that's way worse than any of our festivals have ever been. Like, out of control was. <laughs> we got the Nico... Nish- Nico... Nish- 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 I can't even pronounce it, dude. Nicoba County... Nicoba County Fair. Neshoba County Fair. Fuck, there it is, right there. Neshoba County? Yeah, out there in uh, Mississippi. Out there in Neshoba. Oh. It's, it's, and it's literally just everyone getting drunk, fighting, but there happens to be a country band in the background. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's usually how those shows can yeah. go. But country, yeah, it's just the gatherings that are dangerous. Yeah. I'm, 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 I like country music, the music itself. I used to listen to, uh, con- I used to listen to country a lot growing up, or whenever I was younger with my sisters. Um, we definitely used to go to country concerts. It's just not my genre of choice. Man, there's something days. about you know a cold beer on a dirt road on a Friday night that just gets you excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was in uh, Arkansas this past weekend, and before I turned my phone on the, uh, my radio, I, I just did the local channels, and literally three songs in a row were like about a dirt road, cold beer on a Friday night. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's the formula for yeah. you. <laughs> well, going back to your job, though, what are the best things about your job and your least favorite things about your job? And you don't lie to me, because we will... We, People, we will find out, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Best thing about my job is the end result, the actual show or the festival, like at Buku, walking around, seeing everybody just high-fiving and everyone just being happy. And I think it was last year, um, just everyone just being so thankful afterwards or just like, this festival is amazing. That, like, was, that was my favorite Buku. Yeah. That's straight up like, I don't know what y'all did. Because it was like, it seemed like the year before everyone was crammed. I don't know if y'all expanded or sold less tickets and made the price a little higher, but everything was so smooth. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just had to tell you that last year was my favorite Buku I'd ever been to. And Buku was the very first, Buku was the festival that introduced me to electronic music. Really? Mm-hmm. 
the first one? Did you go to... I've, I've been to everyone except for the first one. I started I, in 2013. That's when I started to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. Do you still remember? Wait, was 13 the year Kid Cudi played? It is. Yep. Like, you, you said how you are. If we just, I just turn it that way and then we're good. Yep. Um, yeah. God, good times, man. In those Fucking early years times. of Buku. Um, yeah. I mean, I think my favorite thing is just seeing people be happy at the shows or be excited or see, um, you know, afterwards or people that met friends or, um, but for me, like, especially like the electronic music, you know, my whole life changed when I met all of these friends and started going to festivals and just the complete path that I was on in my life changed career and like who I was hanging around with, just everything changed for the better. Right. Um, so I think just knowing that I play a part somewhat in that is probably the best part. Um, even when a lot of the times being a promoter, I feel like is usually a thankless job because most people just think about the artist or the venue that they're at, not necessarily who's <clears throat> actually bringing the artist or like putting in the work to like promote these shows. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably my favorite part about that least favorite part. I think is also at the end of the day, it's a business and having to sometimes make decisions or promote stuff that I don't necessarily like or, um, you know, at the end of the day, like tickets are, you know, what make us like we have to sell tickets. So mm -hmm. you can't always go 100 percent with what you want or to give these people a platform. Sometimes you have to do like. Well, I've seen you, you be vocal about artists that I'm pretty sure that was y'all's company putting a platform on. Have you, am I right to say that? Um, as, was that y'all's company? I'm, I'm talking about a uh, something that rhymes with Josh about <laughs> leave, bitch. You know what I mean? I think it was one time I saw you vocal on the Facebooks. No comment. Okay, no comment. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that's okay. You can no comment me. Yeah. All right. I got a talking to, so no comment. Okay, rock and roll, man. You got a talking to. <laughs> that's, all we had to that's all we had to hear. But yeah, uh, so you did mention Buku, and I do want to talk about Buku real quick because Buku is, you know, Winter Circle Baby. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's a New Orleans staple, you know, for, especially for the bass music scene. It's just like, uh, you know, I really feel like I wasn't here for it, but I could just feel like after Buku started happening, the electronic scene in New Orleans started popping the fuck off. Now, this past year, Buku was postponed and then canceled. How big of and and I see you on Twitter talking about how much work you put into Buku because you marketing it. You you said you start September or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So how how big of a fucking mess was it this past year? Like how hard is it to remarket a festival not once but twice? You know we haven't really gotten to that yet, but that's definitely a part of my concern. I think it. And I mean. Most of our lineup, or there's going to be some people, you know, from the lineup that were on it before, and then some new people. So it'll be interesting to see how we market a festival um, that's kind of already been out there, and how can we make it interesting again, or how do we keep it fresh? Um, so I really don't have an answer for that right now, um, just because I don't know, but that's something that we're definitely thinking about, because it just... It, I guess it will depend also what the lineup looks like of like how much we're promoting of like what looks like from last year and what doesn't. Um, well, I hope I'm still part of that lineup. Okay, I'm I just gonna so throw too. I'm gonna throw that one out there. I, still I hope, hope so too. Yeah. I think you will be, but I hope I so. I will too. hope so. <laughs> but so, what was your first initial reaction whenever the city told you you cannot do Buku Festival this year in March? You got to move it to September, and then when in September with the when that when when that the move date or something like September that September was the date that we had chosen yes. to move it to. Um, what was it like the first time that you're like, yo, y'all cannot have Buku Fest this weekend? I mean, it all happened in a matter of. I feel like I lived lifetimes in a matter of days, and when yeah. we say that, like people really don't understand how much we went through in like four or five days of just like our whole world got flipped upside down. Um, initial thoughts were not a big deal we'll get past this like we're gonna figure it out it's gonna be fine and then within like a couple of days we were like okay shit this might actually be happening and then you get to the point where you're like fuck like this is real um yeah. and i mean there was really nothing we could do at the time i think we were all operating on kind of just like adrenal emotional adrenaline at the time because everyone was just 
we were like in game time of the festival. You know, we were like down to our last week where we were about to be on site for a week, not sleeping, like getting everything prepped, like the build was already going. So when we actually found out that we couldn't have it, I mean, it was devastating, but it was kind of just a like, all right, everybody fucking move. Like, let's start working on like a contingency plan. Like, we're going to move this to September. Like, everything's going to be fine. Um and then, obviously, as the weeks went on, it was more apparent that, like, a September festival was obviously not the best decision either. So uh, we had to make the call, you know, that we couldn't do it this year. And it's just like, yeah, it's definitely very gutting to work an entire year on something when this was, like, shaping up to be even bigger and better than last year. Like, I feel like Buku's gotten better every year, so. Yeah. With the side expansion and stuff this year, we were just so excited. And I was then, so stoked to see the new float tent, you know what I mean? All the new, like how everything moved. The new the new site looked awesome. Yeah. It's like it's just like we worked <laughs> so hard up until this point. And then it's just like the one release that we get a year, like this is like just as much of a treat for us as it is for everybody else. So it was just like. Yeah, I get to ball out and just yeah. kind of book all these dope artists, cool stages. Yeah, like that's like. The one weekend we get out of the year where it's like, okay, everything was worth it. Like, this is awesome. But yeah. we didn't get that. And then right after that, they were like, Hangouts cancel. Like, we have to cancel Hangout, too. So it's just like... So how involved are you with Hangout? Or is, so is your involvement with Hangout as much as it is in, uh, with Buku? <sighs> yes. But Hangout... So Hangout, this is the first year that we've taken over Hangout. Hangout's been an AG festival, but it just came under our office this year. So okay. uh, I'm doing the same thing for hangout that i do for buku like all the digital marketing granted hangout is i mean not hangout buku is obviously my baby and i've been much more involved with like helping pick the local talent or helping curate the lineup rather than i was with hangout um but this was our first year so it's like really a bummer that we came out swinging with like the lineup of all lineups for hangout that lineup yeah and an earlier sellout than they've ever had like five months in advance and now we don't have hangout either so it's Big a bummer because it was our first year for that one so yeah man it's such a weird fucking time yeah there's not much there's nothing not much there's nothing we can do about it other than stand up and fight the government can i get a u-haul uh, <laughs> fucking i'm fucking with you I'm fucking. i know you are <laughs> <laughs> i can tell by your yeehaw <laughs> <laughs> but i want to shift gears and talk about something that you know is is you know you're you're a busy lady you know you're doing all this stuff with AEG doing all this stuff with Winter Circle doing all this stuff with Insomniac you know working from the ground up I'm not gonna do the fucking saying I've done three times okay start from the bottom now we here now we queer <laughs> now you talked about um um so you got into artist management like two three years ago something like that and where was it that you were like okay I'm gonna start managing artists and is that something that you're gonna think about doing like is there something is there Possibly a time in the future where you're thinking about picking up another artist that's worth a damn? Like, what do you think? So when I started artist management, um, I really had no initial intentions of getting involved with management or didn't know that was a route that I wanted to take. Um, at the time, I was just really good friends with the boys and Papa S fam came to me when they was that probably like three or four years ago for I don't even Dude, know. it had been it's four been years, years ago because yeah. I hadn't even moved here yet. And I remember yeah. I was at a show in New Orleans with Hyphy. And Mike, I was talking with Michael. And he's like, yeah, well, we just, uh, Taryn just started managing us. So I think that was like four years ago. Yeah. God. Um, if it's crazy. It was that long ago. Um, but yeah, Papa S fam had just came to me. And, you know, they were really just starting to, really starting to produce and like kind of like take off in New Orleans a little bit. I guess they were starting to play more shows um, around the city. And he was just like, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing past this point. So, like, can you help them? And I had no idea what I was doing. I knew what I was doing marketing wise or like knew what I was doing within, you know, some aspects of the music industry. But definitely managing them has been something that's been like a learn as you go process, I feel like um, for me. But I really enjoy it. Um, I love them you know i think the three of us have made a great team for the past however many years a lot of the times i feel like i'm definitely like uh what's the word the mediator the co the mother i mean because you got aggressive you got aggressive michael and gentle jacob <laughs> yeah um so i've thought a lot about management and like if that's something that i would want to pursue and there's definitely 
one person that I've talked to and somebody that I'm super interested in um, and I've tested it out a little bit, um, but it's just really of do I 100% have the time to commit to that? And that's also something that I've been thinking about now because right now I definitely have the time to commit right. to that. Um, but it's definitely a little bit harder when I'm like full time in the swing of things of everything else. So I don't know. It's something I've thought about. Um, and Who's, if it's somebody's music that I really believe in. And so far, there's only been one person that I would even. Who was it? Spill it. What's it rhyme with? Um, I, I can't even make a rhyme for it. Oh, oh does that underground? He doesn't even rhyme. Yeah. Is that underground? Yeah. Smaller artist. Um, Is it in the NOLA area? No. What area? He lives, I think he lives in California. He's somewhere out on the West Coast now. Player Dave. How did you know that? Holy shit, am I right? Because <laughs> because you brought him in one time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dude, I've been a big fan of his for a while. I really, really fucking like his music. Damn, He's I got a really, first really try. Good. Yeah, you're good. I should be a detective, Have I talked dude. to you about this before? No, you haven't, actually. I swear to you. I swear to you. Um. So, yeah, he's somebody that I'm super interested in. Um, him and I are cool. We're friends. I think he makes great music. Shout out Player Dave if people don't so he's listen a, He's an amazing guy. makes great music. Yeah, he's... And I feel like that's kind of like the... People ask, like, what's the secret? And it's like, I think if you just make good music and you're a good-ass dude or good-ass person. That's what, like, I don't... Yeah, like... I mean, you know how I am. I'm very much like if you make the music and you put the work in, then I'm invested into like giving my time into you pretty much. Like, yeah. uh, yeah. Well, rock and roll, man. I, well, I mean, hell, look, I got, I got one question for you. So how much do you pay to gain access to my phone microphone? Because, you know, I'll be talking about, you know, I might be talking about fucking Black Sun Empire in the next second. Uh, Winter Circle has an ad that's sent to me about Black Sun Empire. How much technology goes into shit like that? Because there will be a time where I'll search something, or I'll t there's been times where I've talked about something, I haven't even searched it. Next thing you know, there's a fucking ad, and you're a marketer, so you know about that shit. <laughs> okay, so some of that shit is scary that I don't even know how to answer because there was stuff literally within the past two weeks, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I had thought about it, never spoke it but thought it in my own head and I saw an ad within like the next two days and I was like, you gotta be fucking shitting me. Yeah. Like, but I know how crazy marketing is obviously cause I'm a marketer. I mean, not to my knowledge. I mean, your phone probably is using your microphone to serve you ads, but I have no knowledge of that. Um, but I mean, we do like use pretty much any company that has a website. It's like insane. The amount of data that they can get from you just from you visiting their website. So, I mean, yeah, I'm constantly retargeting people that have either been to one of our shows before of something similar or, like, just anybody that would engage with the basic page. Yeah, I can hit you with an ad for basic. There's like, no way you can, like, so someone searches something, you're not seeing that they're searching this shit, and you can add them? You no. Can, you target them? How I mean, if there, if there is a way to do that, I have no idea, and we don't do that. <laughs> Dude, I mean, I think I think people are doing that shit, man. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it's crazy, like you said. I mean, stuff that you've talked about. It's the same as happened to me for stuff I've talked about, and recently it's just stuff that I've thought about. So I don't know. We definitely don't do that. Um, I want to look into it. It's a good but, uh, tactic because yeah. they're. I mean, I bought it. <laughs> the internet's wild. Internet's wild, dude. Shit, be crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Internet crazy. Daylight coming. Me want to go home. <laughs> 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 well that's awesome dude i can't thank you enough for coming in here i got some fan questions we had a bunch of questions but i narrowed it down to two because they're both really good questions and i felt like they could uh you know be elaborated on in a good way so let's get some fan questions yo taboo and Taryn, this is jalen evans i'm calling from kingsport tennessee and um my question for you Taryn, is out of all of the years of Hangout and Buku that you've helped put together, which one's been your favorite? I love you, Tabu. Much love, y'all. Stay safe. Peace. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, what's been your favorite year of Buku? What's been your favorite year of Hangout? So Hangout, since this was our first yeah, year yeah, doing that's it, true, that's true. I don't have one because I've actually never been to Hangout because... <laughs> that was part of the reason why I stopped doing Insomniac also was because EDC and Hangout fall on the same weekend. So now that we took over Hangout, I can't do EDC. Um, Bummer. So, so yeah, I've been doing EDC the past like four years, um, which it's is a usually good time, the same huh? I've time. never been. Everybody, anybody that has anything against mainstream festivals or 
Sorry. Oh, wow. She has her phone on during this podcast. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to take this time to say, if people are booking EDC, book your boy. I want to play. Okay. Yeah. Shout out, Taboo. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, everybody should go to EDC. I think at least once. Nothing Everyone, nothing but good things. Yeah. There's a reason why it's the best. It's like the Mecca for a reason. Um, but yeah, so I can't really answer to hang out, but Buku... I honestly don't know. I guess I would say 2019 because I feel like every year has gotten better. Like, I went to the festival as a fan from 2013. I think I started promoting it in 2015. And then I actually started working on the team in 2017. So I've officially been on the team for like three years. Um, And I honestly feel like it's gotten better every year that we've done it. Uh, And I think sucks because i was gonna say the same thing about this year but i think one of my favorite parts is the buku lates just like going crazy with them and people just like shitting themselves when we announced because it's just like stuff you would never expect and last year we had first to last from first to last and mm-hmm. like that's something nobody ever thought and we fought really hard to make that happen you know um so yeah and i think this year spicy boys was something that i put them on super early and i was so fucking excited about that and like the Deadbeats party, like Subtronics, Wooked on Tronics, was like my whole thing. I, I wanted that. The taboo said it. The taboo the said it, Buku. <laughs> hey, you know I plug taboo. Yeah, um, I know, I know. So, yeah, I would say 2019, I guess, because I think it's gotten better every year. Who and my your, parents went last year. Who was your favorite set 2019? Yep, just, there's no multiple, there's just one. That's not fair. I can tell you mine. Get her visceral. Okay. Mine was Kevin Gates. I don't. I think I saw like five minutes of Kevin Gates. Dude, it was fucking awesome. Yeah, it was so good. I saw Kevin Gates like six years ago, and it's god awful. But you can only get better in six yeah, years. You can only get better. You know what I mean? I wasn't even producing six years yeah. ago. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, dude, Kevin Gates was hitting that shit. I think Mayday Parade might have been one of my favorites. That too. was a good and set. And G Jones. That was a good set. The year before was probably one of my all time favorite though. A day to remember. Dude, I I teared up when I tell you we fought for that for years. Like, we had this idea that we wanted to cross electron. We were like, this makes sense to like, it worked. do this. It worked. And it worked. And we fought so hard for years to make that happen when it finally worked. I'm telling you, when a day to remember played, me and my boss were standing up on the balcony. We literally both were crying at the same time because I was like, it fucking we worked. It worked. We well, let me, I want to ask you your opinion because, I mean, you're not involved with Voodoo Fest, <laughs> but I want to know, do you think My Chemical Romance was going to play Voodoo Fest this year? I think they were. I looked at the schedule, looked at everything was lining up. I thought My Chemical Romance was going to play Voodoo. I feel like I would have heard about it, though, mm. and I didn't. I bought a ticket. So, I mean, I think it could have been a possibility. Not to Voodoo, but, but I bought a fucking My Chemical Romance ticket My in Chemical Houston. Romance. Mm-hmm. I would say jokes on us. They finally reunited. Like, And then they don't even get to fucking do <laughs> yeah. it. They haven't canceled it, but you know it's coming. Yeah. There's no way they're going to be in arenas. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I'd be interested to know if they were. Because I feel like I usually hear about at least the headliners. But I hadn't heard much about it before. So I don't know how far they were into their booking before they decided. I want to ask you something silly, man. So you started off at, the, you know, you're a business lady at this point, you know. But you didn't always start off there. You start off going to shows, right? Were you, would you say you're a rave girl when you started off? Oh, I was definitely a rave girl. Oh, I yeah. can show you old pictures. Now, like- I was about to ask, what's one of the most, I wouldn't say embarrassing, but iconic. Maybe embarrassing outfits that you were on the rail for not even the rail just that shows where were you one were you one of the girls who dressed like fairies i mean it's i wouldn't say embarrassing but i definitely was in fluffies and fishnets and Fuck like yeah. candy up it's to not my embarrassing elbows. own that shit yeah jewels everything and then i just became a lazy look and was wearing like you know <laughs> harem pants and running around barefoot just like raggedy at a festival and now i'm just like you're typical i wear jeans and a t-shirt because black. I, <laughs> all black you're like that girl works here <laughs> typically just trying to hide in the corner at shows honestly i see you you're in the corner like sup always though am i not i'm usually just in the corner like, you're like yo mitch sup i'm just like <laughs> everyone's raging you're just like chilling well, like, you're like is my bedtime yet <laughs> usually i'm like i'm tired i just gotta see this you'll one tell thing. me like i'm tired I'm i feel bad if i don't or then i'm just like i don't want to talk to this person because i'm really just trying to watch a show like, but then i've seen you on the complete opposite spectrum of that where you're like your head's off your head, oh, i said heads off i took my hat off <laughs> your fucking head banging and shit yeah yeah i've seen it all I can wild out when I want to. I definitely, it's funny because when I first started working at AEG and I went out to LA for some meetings, I'm like, 
in these meetings with like all these like marketers and it's just funny because it's like very clear who like the woke festy kids are and i'm like wearing my third eye pine cone shit in there and i'm just like referring to some of the electronic music that some of them have no idea and i'm like i'm definitely the woke of the company like yeah. that is for <laughs> yeah. sure <laughs> yeah you're like <laughs> that's fucking awesome for yeah. sure the, every every company needs a woke yeah, it's fun, though. There needs to at least be a Wook in HR. If anybody needs advice about electronic or any of that shit, like, they literally all just come to me. Yeah, they're like, how's this artist doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to another fan question. This is the last one, actually. Hi there, Mitch. Hi there, Tarn. Hi there, Universe. This is Dustin from Milwaukee, a.k.a. Jesus Christ, Jesus a.k.a. Christ. Little Trust Fund. Um, just wanted to call. I had a couple questions. Um, so I'm actually... I actually manage a musical artist called Mystic Visitor, and we have our debut album dropping this Friday. Um, obviously, you know, she manages S-Fam and does a well, pretty, pretty decent job with that. Uh, we all love S-Fam here, obviously. And, um, I mean, Buku, I mean, some, some of these festivals are incredible. Uh, I guess my big question would be, I mean, what's something you would recommend to, you know, someone, uh, maybe a manager just getting started here, wanting to, you know, kind of get some exposure to, you know, someone really talented, getting that uh, debut album this Friday, Dehumanization. And uh, Spotify, all major music retail uh, venues. And um, yeah, just uh, again, love from Wisconsin. Love you guys. And uh, uh, after you answer a question like that, Tarn, what's your favorite kind of cheese? All right, thanks. Love you guys. That's my boy. Um, question. So is he? Uh, he's, he's he's asking how does he get? How do what, what? As a manager, what's some things that you can do to get some art your artists out there? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing when you're first starting out is just consistently or consistency that you need to like keep releasing music and not just be stagnant because if you put out one great song or one great EP or album or whatever it is, maybe album is different, but people have like that one small thing to listen to. They don't have anything else. And then if you wait for forever to put something else, they've already forgot about you. Um, Because really in the beginning... It's like you don't really have legs to stand on. So if you're going to go try to pitch to press and stuff, they have no reason to pick you up because they don't know who you are. So really, you're just trying to engage with your fans as much as possible or create fans online. So you need to be consistent. And I think just putting yourself in front of them as much as possible to where they're like, oh, wait, maybe I should listen to this guy because I've like seen several things about him. Um, So I think just putting out content and also besides the music, having uh, content that goes with it and just being active on your socials and stuff, which I know is hard for a lot of artists that especially artists that either don't have management or just don't like to touch their socials. I'm a producer. I'm not a fucking social media guy. But that's part of it. And that's what it is. Like if you want to make it in the industry, like you have to accept that you have to keep up with that part of it or you just won't make it. Yeah. Nowadays. Um... Favorite cheese. So, fun <laughs> fact, I have been vegan for over a year. Does that mean you can't eat cheese? It means I don't eat real cheese, but I do eat Your fake cheese. Mock cheese. Um, favorite cheeses would be feta and gouda, but I really don't discriminate, honestly. I Hell like yeah. it all. Hey, I like I like white cheese. I like black cheese. I like Mexican cheese. Yeah. Yeah, I don't discriminate. I love me a sharp cheddar. Yeah, I like <laughs> me a good Asian cheese, you know? So, But all non dairy. <laughs> <laughs> I like American cheese, goddammit. <laughs> But hell yeah, man, I got one last question for you. When are shows coming back? Um, I'd like to know too. So give me, uh, give me, give me your rough, rough estimate. <clears throat> what I see, I will make the statement this has nothing to do with my company. This has nothing to do with anything. I really there. have no idea. What I see, I don't think shows come back till 2021. And I think if they do come back in 2020, it will be Probably in select cities. Um, it will probably be smaller promoters. Um, and I don't know if the bigger promoters will come out with things by the end of this year. And if they do, it will be interesting to see what it looks like. But I think we're be looking the guinea at... guinea pigs. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're looking at 2021. But again, it changes every day, so I don't know. Rock and roll, man. <laughs> I appreciate you coming in and hanging out with me. Getting, I've learned just sitting here talking with you. I'm sure that people are going to appreciate the insider look from the behind the scenes yeah uh dude this was a lot of fun i yeah. appreciate it because you know how nervous i was about this but it, yeah dude i mean fun. you weren't nearly as nervous as fucking baldy dude <laughs> okay uh, he's ner- he's nervous about everything all the time <laughs> dude i'm dude. freaking out <laughs> dude <laughs> my shirt just almost fell back he dude, literally, i'm freaking out anytime before a show is when we're backstage panicking. he'll be like that backstage i'm like calm down it's calm down. fine no nah, you didn't seem nervous man <laughs> No, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of fun with you. I got nothing but love for you. Everything you do for the city, everything you've done for me in the scene. So, 
appreciate you. you. Thank you for being here. And thank you, everybody, who listened to this week's episode of Talks with Taboo. I will see you all next week.